Um, let me take you quickly through single malt. Now, this is a, an independent bottling class. Uh, I own, along with Sam here, a company called Impex. And Impex Beverages is an importer of single malt scotch. Now, what we do is we're going to bring in barrels of single malts that come from di different distilleries throughout Scotland. And the whole purpose of this is, <laughs> I'm going through, is to, is to get you single malts that you typically are not going to have a chance to taste. That's how this works. So by doing this, we're going to go to these different distilleries throughout Scotland, and they're all different. They all are making different single malts, different flavors, different styles, and they're doing that because they're all going to be components to the blends. That's how this works. So Johnny Walker or J&B or Dewar's or Cutty Sark or Chevis Regal are all going to have different single malts that are going to go into those blends. Now, for that reason, those blenders now are going to have to protect their blend, and the way they do that is they're always going to use the same single malts as they start to create their different blends and their different flavors. That's where we come in. Because over in Scotland, you've got about 90 distilleries producing single malt. They're all producing for the blends. They're all going to go into Johnny Walker or whatever it is. But not every one of them are going to get released over here. There's only, out of the 90 distilleries that are produced, there's only about 40 or 45 of them that, that are going to be produced under their own label to be shipped over here to the States. So when you go to the shelves on, in the stores, you're going to see the typical brands. Glenn Levitt, Glenn Fittick, Oban, Talisker, Lagavulin, all those guys, okay? Those are those distillery releases that we refer to. Well, that still leaves another 50 some odd distilleries over there that you're never going to have a chance to taste. So that's, that's the purpose of an independent bottler. What we do then is we're going to go to these different distilleries and we're going to get barrels of their whiskey, bring it in, and offer it uh, under a different label. In this particular case, it's going to be the Chieftains or the uh, Black Adder. Each of these, these bottlers have a unique character and style that they all try to develop. So. Without further ado, let's, let's uh, taste the first two malts. Now, I'm going to ask you to pick up the first one, the one on your left. That one is called Glen Grant. If anybody is, how many here have ever tasted Glen Grant? A few of you? Yeah. It's a great single malt. Actually, Glen Grant is one of the components that goes into Chevis Regal. That's what they use it for. That's cool. <laughs> and... This particular one, now, I do, I was going to take you quickly through the process of nosing and tasting malts. For those of you who uh, may be new, we need malt over here. For those of you who may be uh, first time, how many first timers here for the tasting? Wow, great. Yeah, welcome. Super. That's great. Um, there is a technique on how you do this. What we're looking for are the flavors of the malts, okay, and the barrels, and what they turn off. Now, this technique, um, this is not the way you do it, okay? <laughs> what we're going to, what, no, no. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking for these different flavors, and the way we're going to do this Pick up our first one. You're going to roll it in the glass. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm looking for viscosity. And that's going to be determined by either the teardrops or the sheeting that happens on the side of the glass. In this particular case, it's kind of sheeting on the glass. So this is going to indicate a fairly thick and heavy malt. That's all determined by the stills. The shape of stills will give you that. Okay. Next thing we do then is we're going to nose it. Now, nosing any single malt, you want to you take the glass to about here to get the nose because you probably all, all nosed wines, at, at, I'm sure, at a particular time. Typically, with a glass of wine, we stick our nose down here and take a deep whiff. You do that, that'll be the first and last malt you'll nose for the evening. Um, that's all alcohol down there. Yeah, what you want to do is let the nose malt come to you. There it is. Next thing we're going to do then to taste, well, the way we do it in Scotland, 
is you want to take a little bit, put it at the tip of the tongue, spread it throughout your palate. Go ahead and do that. Move it throughout your palate. Get the flavor. Okay, nice and flowery. The next thing we're going to do then is we're going to take a little bit of water. Now you have a bottles of water in front of you. What I like to do is uh, I actually use the cap as a measure. So take a cap full of water. Pour it in your malt. Roll it around. Okay, let's re-nose it. I love Norton. <laughs> re -nose it again and taste. Wow, do you see any difference? Yeah. Because what's, what has chemically happened now, you've actually altered the malt. What you did was you forced esters. Esters are the oils that were derived from the barley when we went through distillation. The problem with it is when we go through this distillation process and we bottle these, these esters tend to get closed and tight and shut down. So when you bring a bottle home and you open it up and you want to pour your first dram, all you're going to get is alcohol unless you add just a couple of drops of water. Now, how much water you add really is up to you. That's, you're now the blender. You make the decision. Uh, my boss over in Scotland, if he pours, this is hard. If he pours a half a glass of single malt, he'll fill the rest up with water. He likes about 50-50. I, I don't like that much water. Maybe it's because the amount of single malt he consumes. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. So as you go through this tasting then, what you want to do is go taste in that process. You want to uh, nose it first. Look at, the, look at the viscosity. Nose it. Taste a little bit first, add a little water, re-nose it, and retaste. Okay? So the first one that we've tasted now is Glen Grant. That's the regular bottling. What I'd like you to do now is taste the next one. This is, this is the Glen Grant that comes from uh, Chieftains. Now, here's what's different about it. First of all, it's a single barrel. And this is a particular barrel that I picked. When I ran across this barrel, it was, it was so different. I've never tasted Glen Grant like this before. And the reason it was is because it came out of a white wine barrel. It actually came from a, a white burgundy barrel that I've really, they don't use very much at all. They use mostly bourbon. And so because it was so different, it was a lot of fun, and I decided to bottle it up. That's the purpose of an independent bottler. If we bring something in, it's always going to be different. Now, the, the, that's the good part. This is a double-edged sword. The bad part is there's only one barrel. And so the bottling on this, I believe there was probably about 300 bottles. So we'll get different bottles depending on the age of, that, of those barrels as we go through the selection process. Okay. So can you see the difference between these two, between one and two? Dramatically different. And that's exactly what this is all about. That's the job of an independent bottler. OK. In Scotland, you're going to have all kinds of different regions, all kinds of different flavors. This happens to be lowlands. Uh, you get over to the oceans. I'm going to quickly take you through this just to demonstrate how all these malts are so different and have so many different flavors to, again, create the blends. That's the purpose of single malt. Single malt is primarily designed to create the blends. Now, we have two different kinds of alcohol that we produce in Scotland. First kind is what we call grain whiskey. And that's coming off of this, what we call a continuous still. And grain whiskey is what, we gonna, is what we're going to use to create the blends. Uh, blended Scotch whiskey is simply two elements. Let's pretend this is a bottle of Dewar's, okay? In this bottle of Dewar's, you're going to have two main elements. You're going to have this grain whiskey, and they'll fill the bottle up to about here. Then the balance of it this much is going to be single malt. 
What's interesting is that in that much single malt, there's probably 30 to 35 different distilleries. And it's those 35 different distilleries that are given each of these blends their unique flavor. So grain whiskey. Single malt, of course, has to be pot distilled. That's Scottish law. That's regulation. We have to, ma we have to make it from barley, and we have to pot distill it. Interesting enough, there's one other category in, in distilled spirit that will require pot distillation. It happens to be down in France. Anybody want to venture a guess? What is it? Anybody? Cognac. Cognac. You got it. Cognac. Cognac, by French law, has to be pot distilled. And this is where you get all your flavors. This is where all the differences come in. It's this technique. Now, you see all these different shapes and sizes? They're all going to have a different effect on the, either the lightness or the oiliness of your single malt. I'll show you that in just a bit. Well, each of these guys are different. They all have different locations. They all have different styles. This happens to be Longmorn. Longmorn is a distillery that it produces single malt for, again, Chevis Regal, uh, one, of the main, one of the components. Uh, here's one called Kalila, for those of you who have tasted it. You'll notice that it sits right next to the ocean, and of course, what are they going to get? A lot of salt sea air, a lot of that effect, right? Uh, that's, that, this is all uh, by, done by purpose. This is, all of these distilleries are going to have all their unique flavors. With any distiller, though, one of the more important elements is going to be his water source. It's the different water sources that will begin to create your single malt. So what they're doing here, th these waters that you see come from the springs up in the mountains, and they tend to be very minerally, a lot of mineral content to it. It's going to have a lot of that, uh, those elements. Here's the waters at, uh, from one distillery, the newest distillery that we were showing at, a, at, at the show. If you don't get a chance to, didn't even get a chance to taste it, come on over and see us tonight. A distillery called Kilhoman. And Kilhoman is actually the newest distillery in Isla. The waters here flow over these peat bogs and they pick up some of that brackish peatiness that's translated in, into the malt. So what we're gonna do is take the water, put it on top of the barley. The barley starts to grow, it starts to sprout starting to converting, converting starch to sugar. Once we get it to a certain point, then we're going to drain the water off, dry the barley. Now, the drying process is going to be different depending on the regions. Each of the regions are going to have this different drying process. In the lowlands, they'll basically use gas fires. Gas fires won't impart any flavor component into the grain, so it's going to stay pretty neutral. You move on up to the highlands, now they're going to use these uh, coal fires, and they'll throw some peat on now, depending on how many bricks of peat I throw onto the fire will determine my either smokiness or the lack thereof. This is where they begin to control the amount of peat. Everybody asks me what peat is. It's nothing but compressed vegetation. So once they're finished here, we're going to take that barley, the soaked barley, we're going to grind it up, shovel it over into this uh, mash turn. The mash turn is this big kettle that you see. Okay, we're going to put some hot water in here. Now we're going to turn this auger on, stir up all this barley, try to release as much of that sugar as possible, take that liquid out, put it over into a holding tank, and what's left in here then is what we call draft. That draft will be shoveled off. That liquid is then put into the holding tanks. We're now going to add some yeast. Yeast will start to, uh, the fermentation uh, starts. Here's where it becomes different again. Each of these distillers will have different yeast strains that they'll use. Some will use brewer's yeast, some will use distiller's yeast. So it all depends on the yeast strains. So you're basically going to wind up with different beer. And that's exactly what they wind up, and that's exactly what single malt is. It's nothing but distilled beer. And yes, you could take 55 gallons of Budweiser and distill all the alcohol out of it and have single malt. Wouldn't be real good, but it would be <laughs> single malt of sorts. Big difference, though, between a commercial beer like Budweiser and this, what we're tasting tonight. There'll be one item we'll not go into it, and of course, that's hops. So single malt, something about barley, yeast, and water. I'm only going through all this process just to demonstrate how different each of these distilleries and, and single malts are. How did they get there? How did they come up with all those different flavors? This is how it works. So now we go to the stills, and here's where you get your differences. Each of these still shapes are going to create different viscousness, different thickness of your malt. And it all comes down to that shape. 
Now you see all these different shapes. This particular one right here, you see is fairly large. But this has what we call a boil ball. Another term for it is a refraction ball. What happens here, as distillate rises inside this globe, it cools, forced back into the still, so you get this, what we refer to as refraction. Off of this particular still, you're gonna get a fairly heavy, oily style malt because of all the refraction that's going on. Now they're putting it into the smaller stills and they'll finish the process. Each of the still shapes are different and they all have d unique sizes. You notice this one, quite a bit taller, quite a bit narrower. What you're getting off of here and the way the stillman described this is as distillant rises inside that copper pipe because it's so narrow and so tall, what happens is all the heavy fusel oils attached to the copper. What comes off the top then is much lighter, fruitier whiskey. You're not getting any refraction. Here's another set. This happens to be one of my favorites. This is Talisker. And Talisker, now I've got to complicate your lives a little bit further because you see this pipe here? This is what we call the line arm. And the line arm is, is going to determine the amount of refraction we're going to pull off based on the angle. If I have a fairly flat line arm like this, the refraction is not going to be as dramatic. And so the oiliness won't be as heavy. You get a dis distillery like this, the line arm is dramatically down. I'm going to pull a lot more refraction off, and I'm going to get a lot oilier whiskey. McAllen. Yes. <laughs> anyway, so you can see they're all different. They're all, they're all unique. Okay, let's go to uh, our next two malts. We're going to taste the regular dis uh, bo uh, distillery bottling. It's called Isle of Aaron. That'll be your malt number three. So if you want to pick up number three. Now, Isle of Aaron is an island whiskey, and because of that, you're going to pick up some of that um, salt sea air, a little spicier influence. It has, it has to do with the location, yes, but it also has to do with the actual distillation and the, and the actual stillman. And I'm going to try to describe that to you because, well, before I do that, I want you to now, has everybody tasted the regular bottling? Okay. The next one is one called La Cranza. Now, that's actually the town where the island of Aaron is. And this is actually a Black Adder bottling. And it's, the, the Black Adder company has a special process that they do. They call it raw cask. Raw cask meaning simply, we took it out of the barrel and there was no filtration. They didn't filter it. Any particles that were left in the barrel are in your bottle. Their theory and their philosophy is to leave it as natural as possible. So tasting these very same malt, it's a very same, same malt, same distillery, tasting them side by side. Now, the black adder is cast strength, so you will need to add just a little bit of water to it, okay? Take it down to the normal bottling proof just by adding a couple of caps full of water. But here again, it's an example of what we're trying to show you, the difference between an independent bottler and the regular bottlings. They're always going to be different. Always. They're never going to be the same. There's no use of us coming out with a 12-year-old Glen Levin. It's already out there. So we'll come out with 11. We'll come out with a, sher a sherry uh, expression. We'll come out with something different. In the case of the, uh, of the Glen Grant, we found this white wine barrel really different. That's what we do. That's what the independent bottler does. Any questions? Yes, sir. No, we don't do any re-barreling. Re uh, the way we, uh, I'm going to get to the source and the cast here in just a minute because the casks themselves are, are going to be used primarily for fillers. Fillers for blends. But I'm going I'm to get to that in just a bit, okay? 
Okay, now I'm going to go to this, back to the still. What's happening now after the distillation is coming off, it's coming through this device called the spirit safe. This is where the stillman, again, is controlling that run. Here's what he's doing. He's actually watching the run, and what he's going to do, he's going to move test amounts into these test tubes over here to actually measure alcohol levels. Here's the test tubes. Because at the beginning of your distillation, you get what they call the four shots. Four shots contain a lot of the sulfurs, a lot of the heavy acids. You don't want any of that stuff. So what the stillman will do, he'll take this lever up on top, move it over to this side, takes this pipe, move it over to that beaker, and that will send that first portion off into a separate collection barrel. As distillation continues, now we start to get to the pure spirit. Now everything is right. Alcohol levels are correct. The clarity is correct. The vis uh, viscosity is correct. Everything is right to go. So he'll move the lever back, take the pipe over here. Now he'll send that to the collection tank. At the end of your distillation, you get what they call the faints. Over here we call it the tails. The faints, again, the alcohols are now boiled out. There's not a lot left. So now it's going to start to get pretty heavy and oily and sludgy again. So again, he'll move the lever over, and that's what we call taking that cut of the run. It's that center cut that we're looking for. Now, here's the trick. Each of these distillers will take a little bit more of the four shots or a little bit less, depending on the flavor profile that they're looking for. So if I take more of the uh, four shots and the faints, I'm going to get spicier malt. That's where some of that comes from. If I take less, I'm going to get a very soft, mellow malt. So it's all handled. Part of those spices that you're tasting are handled through the actual taking of the cuts. Here's, I wanted to show you what some of these four shots look like. This, these are the four shots. See how cloudy and all that stuff is? Again, acids, nasty stuff. You don't want any of that. And this is what it looks like when it's coming off the still. Now it's pure spirit. Now we're going to take it, we're going to send it to the collection tank, and then we're going to barrel it up, and then to the warehouses it goes. And this is where the work really begins. So as they go to the barrels now, a lot of things are happening. You're getting oxidation, and you're getting evaporation oxidizing in the barrel of whatever was in that barrel prior because in order to age single malt, we're only going to use used barrels. I only go to that point because that goes back to, again, the independent bottler's job. What we have to do is go through the warehouses and actually pick these barrels out, and they're all different. Some are wine barrels. Some are sherry barrels, bourbon barrels, Madeira, port all these different things, depending on what was in that barrel. Now, generally that prompts the question, okay, if I've got all these barrels and they're all different and they're all strange, how in the world then can a guy like McAllen have consistent single malt year after year? Real simple. Take 500 of this style, 300 of that style, 400 of that style, you put them all together and you get this homogenation. And that, so they have barrel programs that will maintain their consistency. What we're tasting here are single barrel expressions. Different. Okay? Questions? I can see I'm, I'm getting the hook here pretty quick, so. Um. Okay, we're good? Super. All right, then I'll go a little further. We're... I want to show you the barrels because even the size of the barrels are going to change and it's going to become pretty dramatic. These are what we call sherry butts. And these, these guys come from the sherry bodegas in Spain. They're, they're, fifth, they're 500 liters, about 110 gallons, pretty large. The more common size is what we call a hogshead. Hogsheads are uh, 250 liters, they're about 55 gallons. And those are wine barrels. We're getting a lot of wine barrels. Then the little guy over here on the left, that's a 200 liter job, about 40 gallons. Those are bourbon barrels, and we get a lot of bourbon barrels. Bourbon barrels here, because in the States, you can only use the barrel once, 
you have to discard the barrel and then uh, ship it over. When they ship them over to Scotland where they're now used for making whiskey or aging whiskey. So that's a real benefit. So, <laughs> so that particular barrel is a disadvantage for us. This one is an advantage. The reason is, is because the larger the barrel, if I fill it up and put them on its side, I've got a lot less air, first, air surface to wood. There's less evaporation going to go on. As compared to this guy, if I fill him up full of uh, whiskey, put him on his side, I've got a lot more air surface to wood, and there's going to be a lot more uh, evaporation going on. The barrel won't last as long, plain and simple. So as a result, I'm going to be looking for these big barrels. That's what we look for. Problem with it is, these sherry casks are getting very expensive to source. One of those barrels will run us about $1,800, roughly, empty. As compared to this little guy over here, run us about $25. Guess which ones we're using? Pretty simple. And as they sit in the, as they sit in the barrel, this is what's going on. So we got malt coming right off the still. That's what it looks like. No color to it. All the color comes from the barrels. The first three that you see here are actually 10 years old in, in wine casks. That's about the color you're going to pick up. The next ones that you see here are 10 years old in bourbon barrels. So you get a little more color, a uh, little more flavor, a little sweeter, a little more vanilla. The last ones that you see here are 10 years old in sherry butts. Nice, dark, rich color. So you can see that's what we're really obviously looking for. Again, it's just getting tougher to source. And why can't we get sherry barrels? It's because you folks aren't drinking enough sherry. Come on, <laughs> help us out here, OK? Let's get it up, crank it up. Anyway, these, these bourbon barrels now are going to get sent to Scotland. And, and what the, the Coopers are going to do, they knock them all down, put them on a vessel, ship them over to Scotland. They're going to put all the barrels back together again. But there's a trick. Here's what they do. They're going to add a couple of staves. What they're doing is they're taking it from a bourbon barrel on up to a hogshead. Remember, the larger barrel are what we really want for aging uh, any length of time in the warehouse. So those staves then will be added. Now, if you took one of those staves and you looked at it underneath a microscope, you're going to see grooves that look like this under that microscope. And inside those grooves are all that bourbon flavor. So what's going on now, as the barrel sits in the warehouse, you're getting all this oxidation. It's pulling all that stuff out. That's how this works. So the oxidation now becomes really important. Now, what happens is, after about eight to 10 years, the grooves now start to close down. Now the barrel gets tight. The evolution continues, but you don't get the transfer of flavor that you did in those first 10 years. So what we're going to do is, after they're finished with the aging, they're going to bottle this up. They're going to send the barrel back to the cooper. He's going to refurbish the barrel. And what they're going to do is then retoast it. Retoast it, which pops the grooves back open. Now we can use the barrel again the second time. Again, I'm getting very technical on you in terms of explanation of how all this works. And I'm doing that because just to demonstrate how dramatically different each of these barrels are. So as the barrels then come into the warehouse, what we're going to do is we're going to go through this selection process. And the way we do that, very simply, is we taste each one of the barrels. Dirty, rotten job, but somebody's got to do it. And that process is to find those individual barrels that we're looking for. They're all different. They're all dramatic. They all have their unique flavors. And I hope I demonstrated that. So let's go to the last malt that we're going to taste. This is a real treat. This particular one is actually Mortlock. Mortlock, this particular barrel we picked, and I picked it out of five different barrels. I had five barrels lined up. All of them were good. This one was spectacular. It had all the characteristics that we were looking for. And Mortlock is, is another one of these distilleries that's used for uh, Johnny Walker Black. That's specifically what they use it for. We have five, but not six. Is this number five? Actually, this was actually number two, the second one I tasted. 
Yeah. Out of the five that I picked, I picked this one. The rest of them we sent back to the blenders. And that's how these barrels work. Now, this, uh, let me finish up on this last one. The last one is cast strength, uh, so you will need to add a little bit of water to it. Okay? It's a 15-year-old Mortlock under the Chieftain's label. So it was bottled by Chieftain. It was bottled by us uh, when we picked this barrel out. And again, that's really how this works. Um, so each of these barrels, again, yes, dramatically different. And here's a, a great example. If, you know, so at some point in some tasting, I think what we have to do is probably line up the four or five barrels that we go through so you can see the difference of these different things. That'll take a little bit of a challenge to do, but maybe sometime we can do that. Yes, sir. Mortlock. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's five malts, right? Yeah. You everybody get the Mortlock? Everybody get it? Okay. Okay, so as these barrels come in, the way this works is the blender, <clears throat> the company's called Ian McLeod. They're blending uh, blended Scotch whiskey, and they're doing thousands and thousands and thousands of cases of blended Scotch whiskey for customers all over the world, India and Japan and South America and Canada and the U.S. and all over the place. They're doing these blends. Now, to be a blender, as I described earlier, you have to have single malts that go into your blend, right? And there's a formula. So there's 50 barrels of this particular malt and 25 of that and three of this and whatever the, whatever the formula is. So as a result, these guys have contracts and they have contracts with these distillers. So what they're gonna be doing is bringing these barrels in and they will go into these blends. Now, about six years ago, when the Chieftain's Range was first developed. The way it was developed was one of the managing directors was in the bottling hall, and he happened to be watching these barrels roll down the pike and being dumped into the hoppers. As, the, as he did that, he was watching the end of one of the barrels, and it was a 20-year-old Mortlock. And he was going, ah. So what they decided to do was to go through and basically cull out some of these rare casts to take a look at them first before they actually went into the blends. The example being was the five casts that we looked at for Mortlock. The one that we picked, the rest of them went back into the blend. That's how this works. And it comes down to the amount of casts that you have to choose from. Now, I want to put that in perspective because there are other independent bottlers. You're probably all aware of them. There's a very good company called Gordon McPhail. You've got uh, uh, a Scott Selection. You've got uh, Cadenhead. Other independent bottlers out there, uh, Black Adder, you tasted one tonight. Uh, these are independent bottlers, and they will pick from casts. What it comes down to is the, the range of casts that you get to pick from. And in the case of, of Ian McLeod, we pick from 80,000 casts of whiskey. It's a huge base. So you can see what happens. I can really cherry pick. And that's exactly what we're doing. So the barrel's picked. What happens now, it's pumped into this hopper. Looks like this one is coming in. At this point, it's now uh, cast strength. This is sitting there all natural. This is the way the, the Black Adder would have now bottled this, uh, this bottling that you just tasted. It would have gone right directly to the bottling line. Whereas this particular one, we will, if we're going to do cash strength at uh, Chieftain's, we will pass it through some cheesecloth because we don't really want the, the particles in the barrel in your malt. Um, that's just our preference. So what's going to happen here now now you're going to bottle this, and you'll bottle it either at the regular standard 80 proof. Uh, there's also 86 proof. Uh, we bottle all of ours unchill filtered uh, 92 proof, and I'll get into the unchill filtered right now to describe this. So what happens now is 
you're going to add water to this. Now you're going to reduce it down to whatever bottling proof you go to. Now, here's the trick. 90 proof and below, below 90 proof is where the esters start to come out of solution and it will start to cloud up on you. It'll get hazy. So the commercial bottlers are going to have to go through what we call chill filtering. Chill filtering is passing it through a chiller like this. It'll reduce it down to about 32 degrees. That coagulates all that cloudiness in solution. It's then passed through a filter pad under pressure. Whoops. And then it's sent to the bottling line. Well, we don't do that. What we do is we reduce it down to 92 proof just before the hazing starts, and then we bottle it. Doesn't go through the chiller, doesn't go through the filter. Unchilled, unfiltered. Now, that will tell you that on all of these labels. There are other companies that do this, so you have to look for that on the label. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's what happens is when you uh, chill it down and you coagulate all that, all of that cloudiness, those are some of the oils that you wind up stripping out. And so that is some of the flavor elements that you're going to wind up losing. Uh, it's really interesting, if anybody's ever done this, to take an unchill filtered bottling and put it next to a regular commercial bottling. You can see the difference. It's dramatic. I mean, very dramatic. Okay? And then it's packed up and shipped over here for you great folks so that you can buy your malts and enjoy your, uh, enjoy your cigars and your evenings, right? Anyway, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Good, good question. Price points. How do we come up with the price points? It's, all, it's determined by, uh, in, in a lot of cases, supply of a particular style. Isla malts are more expensive than our Highland malts. Speysides are more expensive than Highlands, and so on and so forth. So to that degree, that plays in. The other factor, the big factor, is the age. Because as it sits in the barrel, we're going to get this evaporation that goes on. What we lovingly refer to as the angel share over there, right? And we have a formula that we use, 5 plus 2. 5% of the barrel, you lose the first year. 2% each year thereafter. So you can see what happens in a 10-year-old single malt, you're gonna lose 25% of the fill. So the more it evaporates out, does it get better? Yes. Does it get more expensive? Yes. Plain and so, it's simple math. Good question, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, again, I wanna thank everybody for coming. I'm sorry we were a little rushed. Um, They've got me on a little bit of a tight schedule, but I always like to end the presentation with a little Scottish philosophy of life, and it goes like this. A horse and a mule live 30 years. They never learn of wine or beers. The goat and sheep at 20 die. They never taste of scotch or rye. The cow drinks water by the ton. At 18 years, she's nearly done. The cat and milk and water soaks. 12 short years, she up and croaks. The modest, sober, bone, dry hen lays eggs for nogs, then dies at 10. All animals are strictly dry. They sinlessly live and swiftly die. And sinful, gentle, rum-soaked men live nigh to tell of three score years plus 10. And some of us, the mighty few, stay pickled till we're 92. <laughs> Thank you.